Road Forward, the podcast for trucking industry leaders, brought to you by TruckSpy, the all-in-one fleet management solution built to empower your drivers to be productive, compliant, and safe. My name's Alex, and we got a good one this week for you. Uh, we're going to cover some headlines that may affect your trucking business. We're going to look at some Reddit fun, and of course, we're going to have our interview with Kyle later on in the show. Reddit slash truckers is always a good one, never fails to disappoint, and I saw this one recently right here. It's when you want a backyard, but trucking is life. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like... To my understanding, though, that like fake grass is actually kind of slippery. So in bad weather, it might not be a good idea. Correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, just 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 a little bit of fun there. And then, of course, this one right here. I need this. So um, I, I've seen this before, too, with different types of things. But um, somebody painted on the back of a trailer, the front of the truck with two drivers looking backwards. So kind of funny if you're following this truck, am I right? Now I'm gonna have links for all this down in the description below, but an article from CDL Life, it looks like Texas troopers begin new campaign to enhanced random CNV inspections. Um, so interesting that, you know, we, we talk about Texas because we're based in Texas and I live in Texas. So, uh, but the main thing to my understanding right here is they're gonna be paying attention to, uh, where was it, right? A random commercial vehicle inspection in effort to deter human and drug smuggling, right here, to deter human and drug smuggling, you see that? So if you're watching this video and you're smuggling humans and drugs, well, now you know. <laughs> Hopefully, I mean, we don't have those kinds of viewers, but uh, but that's good. Um, second thing, of course, is the Biden signs legislation preventing rail strike and lockout. Uh, this is a mixed bag uh, because on one hand, it's like, to my understanding, the deal was not very good for the rail workers, so they don't get any days off. This is from Supply Chain Dive, by the way, as you see. And so, like, on one hand, like, they didn't really get what they wanted, which was, like, days off for, like, personal days and appointments and doctor's visits and stuff like that. So they didn't really get that. But on the other hand, it's like, if there was a strike, freight rates would kind of go up because, to my understanding, freight rates right now are really, really low. And, um... Yeah, so a good good article if you want to get quickly up to speed on what's going on with the um, with the rail strike and whatnot. So Supply Chain Dive has this article for you. And then, of course, last up, um, the fuel prices. Okay, we're going to freight ways for this one. Drop in benchmark EIA diesel price is second biggest ever. And so right here they cover, look, the number is down 21.3 cents per gallon. So drop, so to, like basically a 20 cent drop in fuel prices. I don't know, are you experiencing that at the pump? And if you get a, if you get any kind of discounts, that's also interesting because it's like, well, probably you're probably not paying 475. Um, you're maybe getting a cost plus program. Um, we, I know we have a cost plus, Trucks by has a tr cost plus program. So uh, I know our drivers are definitely not getting 475. They're getting cheaper than that. But um, but still, it's, it's good to see that fuel has started to come down uh, because Kyle and I, we talk a little bit about fuel and he explained how, it was really difficult to make ends meet when you have high fuel price and um, and a, and your loads are not paying much. So speaking of which, let's get into this interview with Kyle. I'm really glad he came on the show. Gives you some insight into truckers and um, you know people that are new in the business. And on top of that, if you're an owner operator and you want to dispatch yourself, um, his channel will be linked below. But we answer all those questions. All right, we got Kyle from the YouTube channel Nevada Trucking and Trails. This is gonna be a good one. This is uh, you know this is the man that's driving team on a two hundred thousand dollar truck, right? Kyle? <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of criticism for it. I got a lot of criticism. Oh, you come out, you bought a two hundred thousand dollar truck, you bought a brand new home, you bought a Tesla, like, and and it's everybody's common mistake. They come out and they spend all this money. I tell you, I did kind of put myself in a predicament. Stuff is, stuff has changed since February of this year, and it's uh, it's been tight. Like the numbers aren't what they used to, and I'm I'm new to the owner operating game, so this is my first truck, and here I am. I am with my wife though. Granted, that's the only reason I made it this far, <laughs> and I would have right. had this truck paid off if I wouldn't have bought the house and the car within eight months. So that's the type right. of money we we're making a year ago. And so right, and so we're gonna mistakes, unpack all of that. Mistakes we're, gonna talk were made. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, dude. That's okay. Uh, because it's just, you live and you learn. And certainly it's, I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, couldn't see that the, the freight market would have changed as, as quickly as it did. Cause it did seem like within a month, it just dropped from like, 
good rates to absolute garbage rates. So, but we're going to unpack all that. So, um, give us just a little bit, like, give us a quick history. What did you do before trucking? Uh, how did you get into trucking? And then what led up, uh, just set us up to where you got this truck and, and just give us the like 60 second version of that. Okay. Yeah. I want to be quick with it. Cause it's kind of a boring story. I've obviously talked a lot about <laughs> it on my channels, but, uh, I started driving in 2016. Um, from 2016 to now I've worked for four companies. Uh, my first year was Warner. I did the family dollar account, did it for a year until they forgot what guaranteed $1,300 a week meant. Uh, I ended up meeting my mm. wife in that first year of me trucking. So trucking has not only changed my life personally with, you know, it brought me into a marriage. Uh, it brought me into owning a truck and a lot of things that's done for my life. So I, I actually, I glorify trucking because of how much it's done and changed my life. Um, you know, I never thought I'd be driving the type of cars I've driven and the house that we own today and the truck that we're in right now. It's just, you know, it's all because of what we, the steps we've done back in 2016. So after that, uh, uh, went local, met my wife on the road. She was driving. She actually has more experience than me. She started in 2015, me in 2016, uh, met her at a, a dedicated place, started connecting, started talking, decided that we wanted to get into a relationship. Uh, she was kind of on the way out of trucking. She had a lot of bad experiences with uh, co-drivers and she just didn't feel, she's very petite and small. I mean, my wife's not even a hundred pounds and she just didn't feel safe mm -hmm. out here on the road and a lot of bad experiences with co-drivers. So she was actually on the way out of trucking. So I kind of, uh, instead of taking her away from her family, cause she was going to be at home uh, and like moving her out to Vegas or something like in Nevada where I was at, she lived in California. I decided to pack up and, and move out to California with her, get an apartment and then I was just going to run out and then, and then let her be close to family while we built our relationship. Mm -hmm. Ended up ended up transitioning out of that job um, and went to a local position out here in Northern California. Did that for a year. They changed a bunch of gun laws and did a bunch of crazy stuff here in the state of California like they always do. And like, you know, gas tax, tornadoes, the dam was breaking where we were living, there was fires. It was like the world was ending when we were in California. I, I turned to my wife and I said, wow. please, for the love of God, try teaming with me. I swear I'll make it a pleasant experience. <laughs> <laughs> and she just said, yes, I'm willing to, you know, I know you now let's go ahead and do this. And so right. we, we packed up our things and we moved back out to Vegas, um, got out of California and, uh, we went to a company before the company where we're at now. Uh, so that, that's two jobs. We started at this company. Uh, it was, I'm going to go ahead and just say who it was. It was, uh, KRS, they're now known as SOAR, okay. based out of Salt Lake Refrigerated okay. Company. They told us all this stuff was going to be, you know, this and that and this and that. We're going to have this many miles, dude. They lied so bad. <laughs> like they, they, we caught them lying so many times. We were there for 30 days mm -hmm. and then we ended up finding the company we're at today. Um, and we've been here ever since, up until from company right. driver to him helping us, actually purchasing us this truck cash, this $200,000 truck over $200,000 truck cash, and then not charging us any interest. Um, so our mm -hmm. bosses set us up for success. We, you know, paid our dues here and just like built a relationship. And I get so many people today and when I, cause I'm very honest on my channel. I put my numbers out. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna sit here and lie or try to make things look better. But so many people were like trying to get me to go sign on here. I need to go do, do dedicated freight. And I'm like, dude, the bridge that I've got with the guy that I'm working with, it's, it's more valuable than a little bit more money. I would rather make less money here and continue my relationship with this guy because I know at the end of the day, things are going to work out here no matter what, you know? Right. And, and like <laughs> at one point I did a, uh, for YouTube, of course, I did a, a video with a couple here in Vegas and they were a little bit older uh -huh. than me and, and they had no experience whatsoever. Uh, and they were just going to get their authority by their truck, getting in the truck industry, right? It's booming. Everybody's getting into it. And we did a comparison truck for truck insurance level for insurance level, the same insurance broker. And we did a quote for our own authority. And, and mm -hmm. our, ours was actually more expensive than theirs were. And they had no experience whatsoever. They just went out and got their CDLs. And I was kind of shocked. I put that video out. I was like, crazy, right? It's, it, what yeah. it was, it, it, it had, had to do with age, man. It's because they were older. My, you know, my wife's 28, I'm 32, and they're like in their lower to mid 40s. So age played a big mm. factor of that, not so much experience, right? Um, although we did, we did have the opportunity to go to a lot more insurance agencies that they couldn't go to due to our experience, which would have made our quote ultimately cheaper. Um, right. so that I, I, I so it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of like the stock market time in the market beats timing the market. Right. So it's like experience in, in trucking beats the, you know, just, you know, just, you just getting into it. 
right? Ultimately, something like that, right? Well, no, not in that case. Not with because their their quote came in cheaper than ours, so that was kind of a shock to me. Right, but that initial quote, right? But you, you said that it, it eventually, because of your experience, it unlocked more insurance companies, and so ultimately, yep. your quote would yeah. have resulted in being cheaper, right? And and yeah. so this is why you rec- like you recommend though that everybody doesn't just go in there and jump out like they do do the right thing, which is go be a company driver, learn the ropes, get some skills under your belt, um, and then from there transition to becoming an owner operator, finding a good company, right? Yeah, in a general sense, I absolutely. But in their okay. unique situation, and I had a lot of conversations with them, I said, look, the market's one day not going to be like this. You know, understand that. It gets mm-hmm. bad. It's valleys and peaks. And I understood that, too. Right. Um, and again, we, you talked about, a little bit about the time. And I agree with you. I never expected it. Just one week. <laughs> like, what was that? You know? <laughs> right. Um, but the reason I brought that up is because when I talked to the owner of my company about, you know, doing that insurance quote video, as soon as I talked about getting mm-hmm. a, an insurance quote from my own authority, he was like, and I'll tell you, it was progressive. He's like, don't go to progressive. Hey, let me help you. If you want to get your own, you want to get your own authority. Let me get you your numbers. I'll get you set up. You know, we'll, I'll, let me, let me walk you through this. That's the type of guy I've built a relationship with. So even though he bought me this truck and all of a sudden I'm talking about authority, like, you know, six months after we're running it and he's sitting there trying to help me get my own authority, there, there's value there, man. Right. No, I, I agree. And, and progressive, um, it's one of the things like that you can't avoid, can't avoid it. You know, they insure like some 95% of all new motor carriers. So unfortunately, like everybody has to go through progressive. They got to do the two years that progressive, no matter what. So that's the downside. Um, but I do want to talk about like this, these peaks and valleys, right? Because I, I specifically remember the, in, in March, I believe it was March 6th or March 8th, something like that. Um, freight waves released bloodbath 2.0, like their article and their video about it. And they're like, Hey, you know, the last year over 20,000 new motor carriers have been activating authority per month, 20,000 per month. The average is usually 10,000 new motor carriers a month. And so for the last 12 months, it's been over 20,000 per month. And they're like, we're, we think it's, it's setting this up that like, you know, freight is going to dip and a lot of people are going to, and they called it like after they called that after March, it just rates dropped. And I, I don't know exactly what the reasons are. I mean, there's probably a variety of reasons. Um, but like how has experiencing that like peak, if you started in about February, you probably experienced the really the peak and the valley. How has that experience been? Well, I mean, that was great. We didn't get very, uh, I think we got like three months of it. So mm-hmm. we came in at the tail end because we were waiting for, we custom spec this truck. We were waiting for our truck to get built. So we came out in January. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. We came out in July. And then I would say the market, I guess it's more than three months. Uh, it'd be five, About we got about seven months. Um, in my opinion, the market dropped in February. So in February. It just, yeah, for, for dry van, for us, we okay. came out and fuel shot up and the rates went down. Like, and I, and I was actually, we took a month off. We were, went out and bought a house and we came back and then we saw that and it was a real shocker. It was an eye opener. But in that, in that peak, we went from basically zero in the account. Cause I remember like we put so much money in our business account. Cause once you put it in, it's in there, you know, you, you don't want to take it out. Mm-hmm. We put so much in there and I was down to like $1,600 in there and I had to replace the tire. And I'm sitting there haggling with the guy about a tire. I'm like, how is this tire $600? Because it's uh, like the whole time I was a company driver, I kept track of these things. I'm like a trailer tire should right. be two, 300 bucks. Okay. Steer is going to be about a thousand, you know, and, and so on and so on. And so this number wasn't making any sense to me. And I'm sitting there haggling with him. I'm looking at my bank account. I'm like, oh, I got no money in there. And then we got our first settlement. Boom. 10 K 10 K came in 10 K 10 K 10 K. We racked up in that, that time period. We had free and clear in the business over six figures. Um, from there until January. Now I did take a big owner draw out of that and then use it to buy a house. Mistake number one, (laughs) I bought Mm. at a bad time and people told me not to do it. And I just, against their better judgment, I don't know, I'm hard headed. I did it anyways. And then I doubled down and then I bought a Tesla. And now I'm like sitting here like, oh, okay. (laughs) You know, like, why am I doing all these things to me? Which makes it even harder for me because now like, you know, we have to live in this truck in order to pay these bills. It's the reality. I'm not out here making, we're not getting rich. My last week, I put out my numbers and my business profited $800 after paying payroll and everything that we needs to keep our house. The business profited $800. Now, I got to pay $3,500 with tires, double coins mm-hmm. uh, to drives on this thing, you know, or if I want to get Bridgestones, they're 65, 
$7,500 for a set of drives, just drives, not the steers. It's insane. The cost wow. has, what, what has gone on tires, shop fees, maintenance, all that stuff that the prices that they're at. And then the fuel being at five, $6 a gallon. And I'm driving a 5.5 a mile per gallon, six mile at best uh, per right. gallon truck. And I'm spec that right. way. I got 355 rears with a performance series 565 Cummins. I ain't getting no <laughs> fuel economy at no speed ain't working for me. <laughs> so it, it's, right. it's definitely hard. The right. only thing I got going for me is is the, the team aspect. And 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 with fuel right. coming so, down with discounts, I'm actually at a point where I can start outrunning my cost, which I am so thankful because the last month, uh, two weeks has been the first sign of relief since February of a market mm. turning a little bit better in our favor. Cause it's not okay. so much the rates, right. it's the cost of operation. Right. Yeah. Which I mean, usually, and that doesn't, doesn't is normally not the case, right? It's like usually fuel starts to go up rates also start to go up. And so it was such a weird, like seeing that, like, Oh, I mean, I re- it was like, it jumped over a dollar in like a week, in a week, the fuel jumped over a dollar and rates are just plummeting. It's harder and harder to book loads. Um, mm. Yeah. It, and ultimately, like um, in, my, in my situation, it wasn't that I um, I shut down my business because of the rates per se. It's just we got that insurance quote and it was double, almost double of what I was paying at that time. And so I, just, I was just like, wait, hold on. If you're going to double my insurance premium, fuel has gone up and the loads are not great. It's like, how do you expect me to... You know, how do you expect me to do this? So, excuse me. So, yeah, that's... Um, and this it, stuff's it's, not going to come it's down. It's crazy. You, you, think, you think they're going to stop charging $800 for tires, $600 for tires? Why, when everybody's paying for that? If everybody's paying... Like, right. those costs are never going to go away for us. The shop prices at the, the dealership, they're never going away. They're not going to bring those prices back down unless everybody starts... Everybody, and I mean everybody, has to go to another shop that has better rates and only use them because they'll refuse to go. That's the only way it's ever going to come down. And I just don't see it happening. Right. And because on top of that, like, you know, there's there's not a lot of like certified, you know, Cummins me- heavy duty diesel mechanics. Right. So it's like those people are ultimately in short supply, too. So it's like, well, if I have to pay the employee 30, 40 bucks an hour to work on the truck, like what's my labor cost going to be? Right. What's what's my shop hourly rate going to be? And so like the costs get built in from there, too. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. If that if if that stays high um, or, of course, you know, Oh, so many truck drivers and, and trucking small truck company owners go out of business that ultimately results in there being less people that need service and maintenance, which in trucking, that's not the case. You know, there's always going to be trucks. Yeah. I mean, you, I want to mention this on the field too. There's a very disproportionate amount of the cost of diesel right now to the, to the cost of gasoline. I mean, right now mm-hmm. where I'm at, it is 580 a gallon for diesel and it is 379 for gasoline. Why is there such a mm. disproportionate amount there? It, it's almost like it's a way to kind of like, now this is like being hypothetical and just kind of like thinking outside of the box or trying to figure it out, like almost a way to kind of put a stomp, stop those high freight rates that we were seeing, kind of like to slow down the trucking industry. Um, it almost seems intentional. Uh, and, and I've had brokers argue with me, like when fuel is this high, mm. they're telling me that, well, fuel's gone down. I say for your for your car, it has. But if you look right next to the red, lettering there's a green lettering there that's my cost <laughs> you know buddy like my bill right. is just it's continued to go up you know i i i, I was actually shocked recently i put fifteen hundred dollars just in one fill up Dude, that's that's great and uh you know it's tough because i covered the fuel a little bit in the podcast and i'm torn too because um you know on some articles right in, in wyoming um they had five refineries now they have four um, operating refineries. And, uh, and so it's like, it does seem like there is some shortage. And of course I covered in the Northeast, how they're struggling to get the capacity that they need. And that's why the Northeast is like leading the charge and how much they're raising their prices for fuel. And I covered that story as well, too, from freight waves. And on top of that though, we had, the uh, I believe last week or last episode, um, a gentleman from TA Petro came on and he says that they, they weren't seeing a shortage they weren't seeing a shortage. So um, it, it, like it, I'm, I'm torn between having the opinion of like, oh yeah, well, if, if the person from we're, TA we're, says there's no shortage. As a country, we're exporting our ahead. oil. We're, we're exporting it. So if we're right. exporting it, why is our cost, why are we getting the short end of the stick? I, and I get it. They could take it and sell it for more and it's more profitable to do that. But I still think like in the interest of 
our economy, having fuel being this high is just, it's a destroyer. You know, it's an, it's right. a big part it's of inflation. Not... It, it's our cost, right. especially when they want to pay you a dollar a mile, but yet your cost could be as much like in my truck. It could, and a lot of guys out here that are getting five, five and 6.2. Anybody who's getting that kind of MPG is, is looking close to a, a dollar cost per mile. Uh, and of course we're talking pump price, yeah. but you know, that when, when there's only a dollar left over and then you got percentage taken out, you got to pay yourself a, a salary, of course, you know, and then you got, you know, I, I'm a W2 employee, so I've got the benefits I'm insured, you know, I've got payroll, I've got, right. uh, uh, back a house, you know, they do my books right. and they, they give me profit and losses. You know, I got people, you know, dotting my I's and crossing my T's. I got to pay for all that. And it's just so many people in your pocket. You know, you, I, you got to know your numbers. You really do got to know your numbers. Right. And, and it's also learning how to, things are constantly changing too. Like you can go to Dallas and then go back two weeks later, it's going to be a completely different situation. And then trying to mm. project that sometimes, it, it, I don't know. Like I get people telling me it's like, tough. oh, it's going to Dallas. It's a good market. It's a great market. Then you get there. It's a dollar ninety all the way. It's, it's just like, where, right. where's this? Where's this great market? Oh, don't listen to these guys. <laughs> they don't know what right. they're talking about. <laughs> right. Right. And uh, yeah, uh, that's crazy. And I want to, I want to get into that, see what kind of insights you gain kind of. So you went from company driver, right. Um, to leased on owner operator dispatched by that company. And now you are a leased on owner operator dispatching yourself. What, what would you say you've learned from transitioning from those three, like three similar roles? Well, I mean, first off being a company driver and being a leased on owner operator and being dispatched, there's really not too much difference. The only okay. difference is that you've got all the risk of now, if something breaks down, you've got to fix it. And when I was a company driver, mm -hmm. I took on that role anyways, I was a problem solver. So that was not, it was nothing new to me. So there really wasn't any difference there. The big difference came from dispatching myself and that's a full-time mm -hmm. job. I mean, like right now I've been on the load board all day. And it's a Sunday. Okay. I'm in California, no, and it's snowing all around me. Nobody wants to pay. So, I, and I'm low on hours. I'm just going to do a reset. You know, I, I I know people that actually live close by. They're going to come down. We're going to have dinner tonight, and I'm going to make the best out of it. Somebody opened my eyes to that. It's like when you're in a situation or you're in a place, close your doors, get out of the truck, and go do something. Make the best of it. You know, make turn a negative into a positive, and take your time off on the road, basically. You know, and it mm -hmm. it's it allows you to work longer, keeps your uh, stamina up. You don't get uh, tired of being home, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I guess like what led me to want to dispatch myself? Cause I could just be on easy street, right. Being told where to do, why take on right. all the extra responsibility with no bit. And I'm not getting any, uh, there's no better percentage for me. I still get the same percentage cut. None of my costs got, uh, uh, my costs actually went up with inflation because my, the owner of my company's costs went up and that got translated to us. Um, right. Some carriers do that. Some don't, it did. It, it happened where I'm at, but the mm -hmm. biggest reason I wanted to dispatch myself is because I started really paying attention when things started, you know, churning in February to my uh -huh. cost. And I felt like my carrier at first wasn't really taking into consideration the extra cost that my truck had with fuel. Uh, and I felt like mm -hmm. they put me in, in markets that I really didn't think were the best markets to be in. So I stopped liking the direction that they were taking me. And, and uh, I just asked the carrier, I said, you know, I would like to dispatch myself. And he said, no problem, which is nice because most carriers would say, no way, you know, <laughs> you want to lease onto a carrier. To let you do that. Just a quick side note. Yeah. I had several owner operators ask me the same thing. And it's like, at the end of the day, like when you give an owner operator that permission, they are now representing your company on the phone. Right. And so it's like, I know there's some, like I, I had training for my dispatchers and I told them, Hey, here's, here's, I don't like, it's not scripted per se, but like, here's some things that you say, here's a general, how the conversation usually flows. And you want to ask these and these criteria about the load before you say you book it. Right. Um, and it's like the concern always is like an owner operator saying like, Hey, Mr. Broker, are you like your mother dropped you when you were a baby? How are you paying me these rates? You know, and that automatically then mm. burns the relationship with that broker. And it may be a big yeah. one that you booked a dozen loads with before. Right. And so it's like that can then tarnish the relationship there. So there's a legitimate concern from carriers um, giving permission to owner operators to dispatch. And that's why many you, you, don't do that. You got to take the emotion like out of it. Yeah, right. you know, you right. Uh, like I got to have respect for the, this is not the numbers on my side of the door. And so. 
Um, and I've had a few issues with a broker and, and me and the owner have talked about that and, and it's no big deal. Um, you know, what they were doing wasn't right either. And it's, it's unfair proportionately between what brokers can do to a carrier and what carriers can really do to a broker. You know, a, a broker can really make things hard on a carrier very easily and there's really mm-hmm. nothing you can do about it. You know, so that, that's something you got to be careful with. You got to take the emotion out of it. You have to have a lot of respect for the conversations you're having because you're not just a representation of yourself, you're a representation of your company. And so right. when I talk to brokers, I don't have these snarky comments about like, you know, why are you going to, you know, I, I might have a little back and forth and I'll say if they really want to have that conversation, like if they say something smart ass to me, I'm going to I'm be like, well, dude, my uh-huh. right off the bat, it's, it's costing me a dollar and feel, how do you expect me to run this for 90 cents? And I, I can't work right. for free, buddy. You know, I'll say stuff like that, and he's just like, hey, that's just what it pays. And I'll say, unfortunately, unless you can get me this rate, there's nothing I can do to cover this for you. But if anything changes, just call me. This is my direct line, you know. Right. Or And, and there's, a, there's a difference between a good broker and bad brokers, too. Like, you know, you'll notice. Like, a, a right. good broker will sit there. Like, I've talked to brokers, and I'll build lanes with all their loads in different locations. Like, I'll pick up in Chicopee Mass. I'll go to Florida. And so I got that run. And then I'll say, okay, now you got a run coming out of there that comes back to Chicopee. So I was like, I'll take that one, that one. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I won't, I'll charge you this one for this rate. And I'll give you a deal on this one. Boom, boom, all together. I got this one. And we'll let these two go together. I already see you got another one coming out on that Wednesday that I can grab two going over to here. But let's knock out the first two. After I get loaded on the second one, I'll call you on that one. You know, and I'm building these lanes and right. then you know, I get there and of course they canceled the second load out of Florida. <laughs> I kind of expected they would. And I was like, well, at least I'm in Florida next to the beach. Right. <laughs> oh man. That's right. Okay. And so, but you were saying, uh, before I of course injected that little comment, but you were saying that the key thing that you learned from, for dispatching yourself was that's where you, you stopped last, last. Uh, I want to touch real quick and go back just a little bit. Why did I start to dispatch myself? It was also because of the okay. control that I wanted. Um, but another thing mm-hmm. is too, is anybody has access to the free dat board. So anybody can just make an email, create a name and you can see loads. Right. And I was doing okay. this, like they would book me out of uh, I like to use Los Angeles as an example. Um, and they would book me to Jersey for 6,500 bucks. And I would go on there and I'd see loads for 12,000, 9,000, uh, you know, 8,000 going to Jersey. I'm like, why are they putting me on these loads? Are they like booking me on the $12,000 one, then doctoring the rate con and then sending it to me. And then they're pocketing like, for, like what is going on here? And it was a lot of confusion. Right. And then once I'm on, now I'm on this side of dispatching and I am the dispatcher, the driver, everything. Um, I realized that those aren't real loads. They're not factorable. So, and that's, right. that's something every day we see there's brokers right now. When I pull up in load board, they got, they got money. They got money on these loads. You would die to be running that load, but they, they're not real. They're not factorable. And so the odds, and what that means basically is if you take that load, a factoring company will not factor them. And it's up to you and that broker now to get paid. And the, the likelihood of them just not paying you is pretty high, especially if you just say one snarky comment like, yeah, I'll be there in 15 minutes, man. Why do you keep calling me? That, that's enough reason for them not to pay you or whatever, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, and, and a lot of those two, by the way, are usually double brokers. And so they, um, what, like non-factorable brokers oftentimes are double brokers. And I, I, I forget in what episode of the podcast we covered a good, a good chunk of double brokers and how it's a problem in the trucking industry. Brokers right now are getting called more than ever from double brokers saying they're a carrier and they're not. And then they just post it on the load board. Um, so yeah, it's a problem in the industry for sure. So well, not, um, not only but, that, they, they, they have their loopholes too, where they could be like, oh, it's no, that's not double brokering. Because I've seen uh, big brokers take a load and then another big broker right. post it for half the price. And I'm like, oh, so that's that's not double brokering, though. That's co-brokering, right? Oh, yeah. So can I, now you're talking about Landstar. Carriers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I am talking about Landstar. So it was a Landstar load. It was like up there for 6,800. Uh, another broker yeah. came in and they posted it for 32. And I was like, that is, and it's ridiculous. Like, and uh, can carriers right. co-broker loads too? Like, hey, you know, I'm just going to be like, you know what? I booked that load, but I'm going to have this other carrier do it. Hey, man, I'll take 200 bucks off the top. It's now yours. You know, like, it's the right. same thing. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. We're going to co-transport the loads, okay? We'll put half of it exactly. in this trailer, I'll, half of it in mine. Let's, let's co-carrier. I'll just sit here at the truck stop, and I'll just start booking loads, and I'll do all the negotiation. I'll get fine-tuned on this, and I'll just start selling it to the guy next to me. 
Anybody right. want to load? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th- th- that's essentially how how you could do it. Th- transition your way out of the truck, maybe become a broker, right? Like that's an, that's an option because you're developing this skill, correct? Talking on the phone, like learning lanes, stuff like that. Like th- like this is a valuable skill, wouldn't you say? The, oh, absolutely. And and it's obviously the work is it's much easier to be dispatched. Like right, and it's more efficient too. Like I I lose days all the time due to my inexperience. I started this maybe. I don't know, maybe four or five months ago. So I am mm-hmm. super green. I make mistakes every week. I'd say every two weeks I sit for a day. And and today I'm sitting out of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a 24-hour market. I could book something in the middle of the night. It's California. And it's not really that big of a deal. I'm low on hours. I got 11 hours on my 70. So might as well do a reset. Tomorrow's Monday. The rates ain't going to get it. They're not going to change. So I, I've actually been focusing on what's coming out Monday more so than what's coming out today and tonight. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's interesting because learning the lanes, um, you know, and like, especially how you're talking about, like, cause I had this, all the same exact things that you're talking about, like all the same issues, like dispatchers would, uh, my owner operators, drivers, they'd always call me like, Hey Alex, I, I, my buddy sent over this load and whatnot. Like, can you call him and book it or whatever? And all of these, those loads always went to nowhere. And it's like, if the drivers or the owner operators were focused on learning the lanes and trying to pick up an additional skill while they're in the truck, that's, uh, that, that's both, you know, helpful to the company, but you, you gotta be willing to take that chance, right? It's like, you gotta be willing to, Oh, darn, I made a mistake. I, I booked this wrong, whatever the case may be. I got to fix it. You know, like you gotta be a man of your word, right? So to speak. Um, but, uh, that that's, yeah. that, that's one thing you can't do when you're dispatching yourself, you can't book a load talk to make a deal with a broker and then all of a sudden open the load board and find another one then call up that broker and say you know what i actually i can't cover this because there's a better paying load or whatever now when you're in the negotiation process you could jump off of it it's bad business to do that um but i mean that you're still you're not sold you haven't signed a rate con but as soon as that rate con is signed then you're in contract and you need to honor that contract uh and and not do any kind of that shady stuff once you say you're going to do something you should do it Right. Which, which is funny. Cause I was talking to a carrier, be, uh, literally last week and I was like, dude, how's, you know, just having the same conversation, how's the loads and whatnot. He was like, dude, last week we got a call. We booked the load. The broker calls me back after we signed the Raycon and everything and said, Hey, I got to cancel the load because I found a truck for 50 bucks cheaper. And he was ah. like, can you imagine if the carrier did that to the broker? We'd get carrier four one one or whatever. You exactly, know what I mean? you're gonna get a freight guard. Yeah, the freight guard, or, or and there's nothing you can do about it. It's it's an un. Now, I'm not an anti broker person. Okay. Um, okay. But I do feel like brokers are in my pocket, and it, and I. I understand that the other side of the argument is well, you can go out and you can talk to customers and you can, you can get and it's it's a fair playing field, but it's not. Because a broker can come in and say, I got 500 trucks because they're a broker. I can only come in and mm-hmm. say, I've got one truck because I'm, I'm a single right. truck operation. I can't speak for my company. Now, I, th- actually being a part of a company with a capacity like that opens other doors for me with certain brokers and stuff. But mm-hmm. I can't go directly to a customer and have the same negotiating power as a broker does. So it's an unfair right. uh, playing field. It, for me, I would much rather be going door to door. Uh, shaking hands with shippers and receivers, talking to like, let's say a manager comes out and says, hey, do you run this lane a lot? And, you know, I can get you this rate and and I'm looking for something consistent. Like if brokers weren't in the picture, imagine how many places that we'd be delivering to as drivers that the the shipper would actually come out to us and try to build relationships with us, the drivers directly and and completely just get rid of a whole broker industry, which I think it should be Mm -hmm. like that especially with communication. I don't see the need for like a broker to come in, book a load or, or, you know, negotiate a rate with a customer and then sell it to us for, you know, sometimes taking 40%, 60% of that rate. But we've got the $200,000 piece of equipment. We got to put the $600 tires on this thing. I think we should be seeing way more of that money. And there's not a lot of regulation, like, you know, real estate's regulated to a certain percentage. Almost, I, I think they are self-regulated to a, a, a percentage, so it doesn't get in all those back and forth weird competitions. And brokers are not willing mm-hmm. to do that. So right, and and I wanted to two two more things for you actually. And I say um, I say that I respectfully, unpack- by the way, for all the brokers right. out there, all the brokers out there. Right. I don't hate you. It's just it's my opinion. I feel like it's an unfair playing field. I know I can go out and talk to customers directly, but the opportunities are far reduced due to the fact of your presence. Okay. Right. 
right. It's a so hate. first, first, <laughs> first thing is like, will technology solve some of these frustrations? Um, and more specifically, is you? I, I, I try to have these conversations and um, with with many people, and, and I'm I'm still always looking for like pushback on on this opinion, which is like. I think freight brokers, like the way it currently is, they will cease to exist in the sh- in the in maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, they will fundamentally cease to exist. The main reason is because um, I think brokers exist when uh, okay, more more vague middlemen only exist when there's a technological problem, right? Um, in the early two thousands, it was stock brokers. People always like. Number one job everybody wanted was they want to be a stockbroker on on the on the New York Stock Exchange right back in the day. And what happened? Well, Robin Hood. Okay, now it's like real estate agents are essentially that's brokers, a great, that's right? A They're great broker, example. brokering the deal, right? Uh, real estate agents look at it. Redfin. Redfin is dominating the market with less, well, with more technology and less people. And I think we're seeing the transition live of this, like eliminating this middle person, which it's going to go to fixed rates. And how are they going to go to the fixed rates is of course with, um, you know, machine learning and AI models for pricing, right. For capacity. Um, they'll be able to live tell you, Hey, mm-hmm. um, your, your price, here's the price we pay. We can't adjust from it. And so you can either click book it now or not. And that's going to be your option. So I, I do, and, and I know there's a lot of apps. Gonna, when I was in business, like that, that's going to standardize our industry. But it, you're like, it's like you know, the brokers right now they're doing the same thing that truck drivers do. We're all cutting each other's throats. You know, we'll come in, we'll start talking, and like you said, they'll come in and offer fifty bucks less, and they'll take it. You know, and the brokers are doing it to each other as well. It's not just us. But eventually, like right. you said, I'm progressive. I, I when it comes to technology and advancement and fine tuning things, I'm all for it. Like, uh, you know, right. automation and trucking and stuff like there is a place for that. Um, right. Obviously, I think, you know, it's a lot of good paying jobs in the United States uh, for people that are going to no longer have that opportunity that we've had. Uh, it's going to take away like the very opportunity that's gotten me here where I'm at. And that that's sad to think about, but it's the reality. Like if we're going to keep up with the world economic industry, we have to advance. We can't stay behind. Right. Um, Right. You know, we got to keep so our logistics. You definitely going, think so. that's the that's the case, though, right? Like you 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 see that on on like well, like you're oh, yeah. you're on DAT lo- on the DAT load board right now, but like, are you using any other ones? Are you using Carrier 360, the Coyote app? Those are usually the more advanced ones that have like the booking now features and all that stuff. Are you using those too? I I, I hate clicking ghosts. I absolutely hate clicking ghosts. Um, they're not quick enough. There's like you know. It's what they do is they'll put something on there and I'm trying to move now and, and they're trying to move in, tw- in 24, 48 hours. So they're not like my availability is now. And, and the click and goes for me are usually like a long bidding process where we as the drivers get to cut each other's throats and then see it. But yeah, you don't even know if that's a driver. It could be AI that you're negotiating with. So I've actually deleted mm. all the click and go apps. I deal directly with any time I can call a broker, talk to them, talk about the rate. Talk about what the commodity is, where's it going, how many stops does it have, a lot of information. Like uh, JB Hunt's pretty good with putting uh, uh, all the information in, in their postings. That's a good thing. Uh-huh. Um, and, and they do have good loads at times. And if it was all like that, it would be more competitive, I think, too. Right. Um, but there's just too many variants right now for that to be like the only way to – and to say it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, you won't really know until then. Because I, right. obviously – if everybody's got click and go and, and they have, they're only going to be paying a dollar and they say that's the market, but yet nobody can right. go book it. It's not going to be the market, you know, like, right. And, and we're not right. out here to work for free. We're out here to make a profit. We're businesses as well. You know, we need to make right. a profit. We need to be able to replace the truck. We need to be able to fix the motor, replace tires without having to decide of what we're going to have to eat for tonight, you know? And that's the sad reality is, is for a lot of drivers out here is they're picking and choosing, you know, not fixing their trucks. Now, a lot of, you're going to see it, you know, raggedy trucks are going to be coming more common because people just can't afford to do it. And they're trying to survive. Um, and it's not like they're going to get out of the industry. You know, when a driver, when an owner operator goes under, they don't just stop driving truck like they go work for somebody. So it's not going to mm-hmm. change anything with the capacity. So everyone's like, oh, yeah, you know, we got to wait for all these guys to come out. It's going to get a lot of people just to go back to company positions you know what i'm saying it, it's not going to change capacity it's going to it's just going to put the driver somewhere else so it's right. not like an answer 
That makes sense. And another question about technology is, I don't know if you've, you've seen the Tesla Semi. Uh, they had the delivery event out there. Uh, I think it was in Nevada. Uh, and so the first one was delivered to Pepsi. Uh, you know, you're driving this this nice nice Peterbilt. Uh, what's, your, what's your opinion on the Tesla Semi? That's going to be my next trip. It will? Yeah, I'll go from a 389 to a Tesla Semi. I, I own a Tesla car. I'm a big fan of Elon right. Musk and his innovation with SpaceX. Uh, the car is, the car is phenomenal. Uh, a lot of people have their doubts about like the, the capabilities of electric, but they're speaking at a churn, like they are out of pocket, like they don't really know, like they haven't done any research. But like these these Tesla semis are up in Alberta in, in the winter, and they're they're being tested uh -huh. in, the, in the cold. You know, they're down in right. Vegas in the heat, and they're in Yuma, Arizona. They're being tested in the heat, like it's not just something willy nilly coming out here. It's a well thought out process. And once the charging right. network comes into place and I can, as soon as I can get two lanes, let's say I'm from Vegas. So if I can get Vegas to Seattle and Seattle to LA, if I get a triangle right there, that's it, with a charging network and then a repair network, which is I think the next biggest thing for any kind of warranty issues, because that doesn't mm -hmm. exist at all right now. And the last thing you want to do is buy a truck and not be able to fix it. And I mean, the million mile warranty, uh, what's the price going to be? Because it's a lot of fluctuation. I've seen it on the website where it's actually pretty comparable what this truck is, 180000 you know, but then now the pricing isn't even there when they did the launch. So what is right. it going to be, you know? Um, right. But I'm excited for it. I think it's the future. Um, I would like to see one actually put out a video of like one with a sleeper capability because we're going to need to be able to sleep in these trucks for the longer hauls. Um, but Tesla right. is definitely something that I'm keeping a big eye on. The number one cost in a trucking operation, hands down, every single person out here is fuel. doesn't matter if you got the most fuel efficient truck or the least fuel efficient truck, it's still gonna be your number one cost. And then driver pay right behind that is gonna be your second cost. Uh, yeah. Other than if you're old, driving an older truck, then it might be maintenance, but. Right, right. Well, that, dude, that's that's cool. Um, yeah, cause like the, the reactions online are always mixed. You know, it's like, oh, it's the greatest thing or it's like, oh, it'll, it'll only do 500 miles or whatever the case may be. It's like. Uh, you know, so it's it's always interesting hearing it from a driver. Uh, Go so 500 miles and that's then uh, yeah, uh, what? You know, you take a 30 minute break. It takes an hour, two hours to charge. 45 minutes, I think, is what it's estimated to charge at. I mean, I drive mm -hmm. a Tesla semi or a Tesla car. And I don't ever have to use a supercharging network. Like I drive it around town all day and I just go home. I plug it in. I wake up the next day. It's got a full charge. I'm good to go. And so I think just nice. people like they got this oh, i'll never do this it's fine then you keep paying the fill bill and i'll drive right. the electric vehicle with and i'll be paying you know 50 percent of the cost right. whatever it's going to cost to charge these things because there will be a cost associated we won't completely disappear you know it's not going to be a, a fuel free system you're still going to be paying for the electric but we also we need things to be innovative in our country with green energy like we need the power capabilities to charge all these uh, electric vehicles it's not just tesla you got peterbilt you got all these other electric semis that are coming out and we don't have like our electric grid is already look at California. Like when even uh, in the peak of summer, I was getting emails from uh -huh. NV Energy like, hey, please don't charge your electric vehicles between this time. Don't do this. Like our electric grid needs to be shored up uh, all across yeah. the country in order to transition into this green energy, which I'm for. Right. I just don't think that we should start cutting other industries that we're already in like we need to keep those things flowing and be in energy independent and and be a net exporter of our you know let's tap it let's get into it and let's let's get right. to a point where we can transition completely to green and and use the reserves for the military where it's not going to be you know right. a tank's not going to be electric not for a good 50 60 years until we can kind of like get that capacity up to move a, you right. know a tank it's it's not like a you know, a little mini Cooper that needs to go down the road, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, dude, that's awesome. Kyle, I mean, you're, you know, uh, for anybody that wants to know more about Kyle or follow along with his journey, how he's documenting the steps, his channel is called Nevada Trucking and Trails. Um, you can, you can see it. He's, uh, he's got that, that nice Peterbilt. It's a nice red truck, nice bright and red DOT magnet or not really. What is it? No, no, no. Actually, uh, DOT is pretty cool with us. They're a little bit more laid back. Um, they will give you an inspection, though, because they usually know that guys like, you know, we're on top of our equipment. And they're like, look, I don't want to give anybody else any hassle. I can see your truck. It looks brand new. I'm going to do a quick inspection. Hey, cool, man. It right. works for me, you know. But for the most part, no, right. you, you get a little bit of slack. But it's right. 
That's good. Well, I think, I think, that, I, like I think red, I've gotten red... got pulled over less. <laughs> so I think I've got really? pulled over less in this truck than my other trucks. So yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, like the reason I, I was like I was making a joke or uh, or just because like you know how they say red usually gets more pulled red cars get pulled over mm-hmm. by police more often or something like that. So maybe red trucks too, but I guess I guess not. Not when they're nice and new and they're and they're the good looking trucks, right? Well, uh, it's it's a show you, truck, but it's it's more of a work truck. So it, it's probably the brake dust hiding all the red because <laughs> trying to get this thing into a, a truck wash and then all of a sudden it's like oh well, it's snowing. I ain't gonna do that. Yeah. Right. Well, um, any any final words, any any last tidbit of wisdom that you'd like to share with the the viewers on on you know what you've learned on your journey so like so far? Um, keep fighting for good rates. Argue with these brokers. Don't you can't take at cost. I get it. If you're in Miami and you know you fell off a load like I did, where that broker kind of screwed me and, and and basically took the load and sold it for cheaper, um, even though we had already worked out a contract. That's what happened to me. You know, it's going to happen, you know, uh, be mindful of that, learn from it and uh, just try to stick to your guns with things, but you got to keep the truck moving. You got to work. Um, you got to be quick for you guys out here that are on the board. Um, stuff is getting posted within it. Stuff that has money on it is ready to move is getting posted and it's gone within zero minutes posting. So mm-hmm. if you're running uh, strictly off the spot market, it's going to be a lot tougher for you. Then if you're with a carrier right now that is doing something specialized, uh, let's say tanker, anything like that's going to be pretty steady. Uh, food, that's why reefer has kind of been staying pretty strong. Uh, but mm-hmm. every market is going to get saturated when when the money goes to another uh, type of, you know, dry van is the lowest, almost the lowest of low. So that's what I do. And then the only thing below okay. me is is box vans, you know. And then you got <laughs> then you got reefers, right? Then you got, uh, let's right. say, flatbed and then sp- tank. Uh, I would say a flatbed tanker than like step decks and, and, and then a heavy haul is like the top end. So mm-hmm. if a, if you're on with a carrier that's got dedicated freight, kind of lean on them, lean on that, you know, uh, get your network, talk to buddies. If you're struggling, know your numbers, uh, go through every week and, and write out your numbers. Like I, on something I've started to do on my channel, I used to do back when the rates were really good and the stuff started getting tight and, and bad. I stopped doing my numbers and I realized that's kind of, that's not cool because I've been getting comments on my numbers videos from six months ago and people think it's still like that. So I need to come out here and put the information out consistently. And so I've been, I've been getting back into putting my numbers out. Um, just work, stay in the truck, work, don't give up, stay positive, make the best of when you're in a, when you're in a bad situation, you get screwed over by a broker, turn it into something good, get out of the truck, go catch a movie, you know? Right. You know, it, it just, you it, nothing, you, nothing you could do or yell or scream at this dude is going to change the situation. Be cool, calm, collective, try to get the most money out of it as you can if you're getting screwed. But, you know, sometimes you just got to say, it's out of my hands. And uh, right. you just make the best of a situation. If you're close to somewhere like a beach, rent a car, go, you know, right. your truck's going to be there when it's good back. If not, it's insured. You'll be all right. <laughs> you know right that's gonna do it for this week's episode let me know what you think in the comments down below and i will see you next time bye